Wings and other such things aside, um, <laughs> do any of you know who this figure is supposed to be? Vine leaves in his hair, leopard skin around his neck, holding a wine cup. Dionysus? Yeah, this is the Greek god Dionysus. Good. And indeed, if you are particularly observant, you will probably see that right up here on the tab, which I'm unable to conceal, <laughs> it tells you that, yes, this is Dionysus. Okay, so what is Dionysus the god of? Anybody know? God of wine, right? Wine is one thing, right? <clears throat> he is the god of wine. He is also the god of things that are sort of broadly associated with wine. Revelry. Frenzy. Wild abandon. And he's usually represented as looking not quite Greek. He's usually represented as looking kind of foreign, right? His chariot is drawn by exotic animals like leopards. Um, you know, you don't find a lot of leopards in Greece. He wears exotic clothing. His hair is done up in exotic styles. Um, <clears throat> so he is also a sort of god of things that are non-Greek. The Greeks were kind of suspicious of a god like Dionysus. The Greeks liked reason. They liked order. These were the, th the qualities they most prized, right? You know, they liked things to sort of follow a sort of median path, right? They didn't like to get too upset about things. Everything should be logical. Everything should be orderly, right? There's a reason for everything. Dionysus is a god of unreason. So usually the idol of Dionysus was kept in a shrine outside of the city, right? You didn't want that influence in the city spreading, right? Getting people acting crazy. But once a year, for a festival that was called the City Dionysia, the gates of Athens were opened, and a wild procession of people carrying the idol and also waving around phallic symbols because Dionysus was also a fertility god, welcomed the god into the city for a few days. And during this festival, the people of Athens put on plays. So, <clears throat> one thing to note about Greek drama is that it serves a religious purpose. A religious purpose and also a social purpose. Right? It's part of a celebration of the god of wild frenzy and unreason. For a few days, the people of Athens allow this foreign influence, this wacky god from somewhere over the sea, to come into the city and shake things up. This is more closely related to the idea of tragedy than it may first appear. Right? How many of you are familiar at all with Greek tragedy? How many of you have ever read a Greek tragedy? Okay, those of you, yeah, those of you who took Comp 2 with me at least should be nodding, right? What do you know about tragedy? How a Greek tragedy is supposed to work? Those of you who are familiar with it, what are the features of tragedy? Someone dies. Okay, someone, often several people, right? Yeah. Although that's not actually necessarily a requirement, at least if we're talking about Greek tragedy. No one actually has to die in a Greek tragedy. And indeed, 
Um, the ending doesn't necessarily have to be unpleasant. Now, the philosopher Aristotle in the Poetics, right, which is the first work of Western literary criticism of any kind, defined tragedy thusly. Tragedy is an imitation of an action that is serious, complete, and possessing magnitude in embellished language, in the mode of action and not narrated, and affecting through pity and fear the catharsis of such emotions. Okay, so on the one hand, right, tragedy is imitation. Right, this is key to Greek theories of art in general, right? The key in Greek art was what was called mimesis. Which, of course, simply means imitation. The Greeks judged art in part on how well it mimicked reality, how well it imitated reality. So all works of art for the Greeks are imitations of some real thing. And a play is an imitation of an action. Right, so a play is an imitation of people in action, an imitation of human behavior. Possessing magnitude, right? So it has to be, if we're talking about tragedy, an important action, right? Something with big, earth-shattering consequences. Something that actually matters, right? In embellished language, tragedies were written in verse, right? It was you know, this this was this was poetry. This wasn't these weren't written in prose. And affecting through pity and fear the catharsis of such emotions. So the purpose of a tragedy, according to Aristotle, is what he calls catharsis. Are any of you familiar with this word? Anybody heard this word before? Anybody know what catharsis means? What is, a, what is catharsis? What is a cathartic experience? What do you undergo? Cleansing. Yeah, it's sort of like a purification. Right? It the word literally means purging. So a catharsis, in Aristotle's usage, seems to mean a sort of a purging of all the community's negative emotions, right? This is what a play is supposed to accomplish. This is what it's supposed to do, right? We weep for the fate of the tragic hero. And in so doing, we purge all of our own negative emotions, right? All of these things that have been building up in us all year as we try to act logical and reasonable and stoic, right? We can just have this annual outpouring of emotion. Then we take the God back outside the city, put him back where he belongs, and we can go back to being logical and rational and stoic for the rest of the year, right? So it is this kind of yearly empty, the, the city Dionysia is this kind of yearly emptying out of emotion. Right, a kind of yearly purging. Not like oh, what are those? What are those stupid horror movies? Where like you're right, they right exactly yeah they they make all crime legal for one day, so that people can just you know get all their negative impulses out. Um, we are talking about actually a similar kind of idea. Now one thing that we'll note as we talk about Medea is that purging isn't just about negative feelings in these plays. It's also often about negative people. People who are troublemakers in the community. Even if the play sets us up to sympathize with them, the troublemaker is usually expelled at the end of the play. Whoever the problem person is is usually gone at the end. All right, so let's talk a little bit about what these plays look like. Anybody know anything about the, the features of a Greek play? What, this, what these performances might have looked like? Yeah. 
I will take your silence to mean no. <laughs> okay, first, right, the actors always wore masks. Right, no one walked the stage with a bare face. Right, the, the masks were usually made of terracotta. All actors were male. Even female roles were played by men. Women were not allowed on stage. Um, and what do we remember from last time about Greek ideas of gender relations? Why is it that women weren't allowed on stage? They were seen as a prize. Um, it's not even so much the prize of war thing. If we think about those household divisions that the Greeks thought were so important, does anybody remember what the name for that was? What the Greek term for household was? This is actually very important to understanding this particular play as well. Oikos. Yes, oikos. And what was the role of the woman in the oikos? Kitchen, living room, the second floor. Yeah, the inner parts yeah, the of the home belonged to the woman, right? Yeah, and the outer part was like the man. Exactly, right? The woman's role was private. The man's role was public. So performing on stage, this would be a public role, right? So one that would not have been considered appropriate for a woman. So all the actors were men. The casts typically consisted of three actors and a chorus of usually 10 to 12 men. Now, three actors, right, but we have more than three characters in this play, right? More than three named characters. So how do we deal with that? Double. Yeah, double casting. And oftentimes the double casting um, is, uh, is symbolic. For example, in a production of Medea, the role of Jason and the role of Creon might have been played by the same actor, right? They never appear on stage together you will never see more than three actors on stage in a Greek play. Now the chorus usually serves as the voice of the people in the play. Right, the chorus interprets the action for the audience and often sort of reacts to the named character's actions in sort of the ways the playwright expects the audience to react. And they tend to deliver their bit in this sort of three-part movement, right? It's called an ode. In the earliest forms of Greek drama, there is only a chorus. And they're basically just hymns to Dionysus performed by a chorus. Um, but see, the chorus, when they would perform their ode, they would um, sing a song in a particular meter and dance to the right. And this was called a strophe. They'd sing in the same meter and dance to the left. This was the anti-strophe. Then they'd sing a song in a different meter and stand still. This is the epode. So when you see the strophe, antistrophe, epode labeled in the text in the anthology, that's what it means, right? That's what they're talking about. Right? It's the, you know, the chorus dancing back and forth, right and left. So three actors in a chorus, voice of the people, over it. So, as far as what the theater itself looked like, so essentially you had a semicircular stage that was like at the bottom of a hillside. And all along the hillside would be seats. 
and the seats essentially benches on which people just lined up were called the teatron. So we see the origin of our R word theater, right? The pit where the actors performed was called the orchestra, which is Greek for dancing place. There would often be, um, at least at the beginning of the festival, an altar at the front of the orchestra called the timile. where a preliminary sacrifice to Dionysus would take place, usually of a, of a goat. In fact, um, the word tragedy de uh, derives from the Greek tragos, which means goat. So a tragedy is a goat song. The etymology of this is sort of disputed. Um, there are some who argue that this is because um, the prize for the best tragedy was um, a goat or a couple of goats. Um, which, you know, again, you know, we're talking about ancient Greece. Right? A goat was actually worth a lot of money. Right? This was actually a pretty damn good prize. Um, it may also refer to you know, a, you know, a sacrifice of a goat that occurs at the beginning of the festival. At the very back of the orchestra, is a permanent backdrop with a couple of doors in it called the skena. Skena means tent. The doors from which characters would enter and exit were called paradoi. Right, so if one actor has to change roles in the middle of the play, right? You can exit through the doors, put on a different mask, come back as a different character, right? And there were often little sort of temporary pieces of scenery you could hang off of the skena, and that was called the paraskenia. Later on, productions also often included a crane called the Mekana. How many of you have ever heard the term deus ex machina? Do any of you know what a deus ex machina is? Okay, it's like if you're reading a book or watching a TV show or a movie, and then like it seems like you know the characters get themselves into some situation that can't be resolved through any normal means, so something from outside then just shows up and fixes everything, that's deus ex machina, right? And what that means is God from the machine. What that refers back to is these ancient Greek plays, which would often end with a god being lowered down to the stage, or a character, or an actor playing a god being lowered down to the stage by a crane. And then the god makes some sort of pronouncement that you know, sort of fixes everything. Um, we have a scene that would have required the mechane actually at the very end of this play, right? When the, the sun god Helios sends his chariot down to whisk Medea away, right? That would have been a use of this crane. So Greek plays actually did have special effects. Um, there was also a vehicle or cart that could be wheeled out to perform um, interior scenes. Right, so if there was something that's supposed to be going on behind the skena, but the audience is supposed to see it, they'd wheel out the cart and the scene would be performed on the cart. And that's supposed to represent indoors. Also, all violence in a Greek play usually takes place off stage. So the evidence of the violence, you know, the dead bodies, are usually then wheeled in on the cart after the fact. All right, so this is basically what Greek tragedy looks like. Now, what did you think of this play? How'd this go for you? I thought it was good. Okay. She, she's psychotic. <laughs> okay, well, you know, um, there are ways in which 
her, like, her actions actually do make sense. There are ways, that there is actually a logic to Medea's behavior. Um, she appears to us to be unhinged, right? And to some Greek audiences, she would have appeared to be unhinged as well. One of the things Euripides is doing is playing on male-female stereotypes, right? The Greek man, as we know, is supposed to be rational and stoic, right? Is not supposed to show a great deal of emotion in public. He's supposed to be reasonable all the time. So, if the Greek man walking about in public is supposed to be rational and stoic, can we make some sort of guess about what the stereotype of women would be? Yeah, in fact, the, the word hysteria actually comes from the Greek word for uterus. So yeah, a woman, a woman, according to Greek stereotypes, is supposed to be irrational. Lustful. And not terribly clever. Right? So a man is supposed to be rational and logical. A woman, according to Greek stereotypes, is basically a slave to her impulses. Now, how does Medea herself defy this particular stereotype? Is she irrational? She's actually kind of scary rational, right? She's very, very intelligent. She knows spells and charms and medicines. And more importantly, she seems to have a great command of language, right? She is a very effective rhetorician. Now, rhetoric in the 5th century BCE would have been an art relatively newly introduced or relatively newly developed in Greece. Right, we may have talked a little bit about this last time. Um, does anybody know off the top of their heads what the system of government was in ancient Athens? At least for a time. What do we call Athens the birthplace of? Democracy. Yeah, we think of Athens as the birthplace of democracy, right? It wasn't sort of democracy as we would recognize it, right? it was not representative. Um, people do not, did not sort of vote for members of an assembly. But every freeborn male who lived in Athens had a right to vote on matters of civic importance. So if there's no official government structure and no sort of official law code, essentially the way you get things done is by being really good at persuading people to see things your way, right? by getting really, really good at rhetoric, by becoming an eloquent and persuasive speaker. So there were these guys who wandered around um, Athens. Most of them were foreigners, uh, but they settled in Athens around the fifth century. Um, they were called sophists. And essentially what they were were itinerant teachers of rhetoric. Right? The word sophist comes from the Greek word sophia, uh, wisdom. Uh, and it means something equivalent to wise one. Right, the most famous of these guys uh, were Gorgias, Protagoras, and Isocrates. Not to be confused with Socrates. Different guy. And so the sophists said that for a fee, they could teach young men how to argue effectively in the public assembly. Right? They would teach them the arts of eloquence so that they could become men of influence in the state. Gorgias, for example, claims to be able to convince an audience of one proposition and then turn around and through the power of his speech convince them of its exact opposite. So the sophist's method yeah, is based entirely on 
language on, entirely on pretty speech, right? This is what they teach. They teach people how to speak effectively. And essentially what we get in this play is a series of competing speeches and competing arguments, right? Where do we see, like, who, who do we see giving these sorts of competing speeches? Okay, we have, yeah, the big one would be the argument between Medea and Jason, right? Right? 